this is our prayer today. That your kingdom come in our lives and that your will be done. Not our wills, but not our will, but yours, Lord Jesus. And that your kingdom, your power, and your majesty, but most of all, your grace and your love will be here, Lord God. Let's sing this last verse. said amen. amen amen so why don't you guys stand and kind of wave to one another um, bump fists if you want or elbows or uh, just want to say thank you so much for coming and uh, we thank you online as well um, we say hi to the winds that are at home and any of the other families that are at home, we're just so glad that you're here and that you can participate with us. And Chris, why don't you come on up? And we'll get on to the announcements. I am Chris. Hi, Chris. <clears throat> so we're now supporting a new Lavinia church plant in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, by a couple from Bogota, Colombia. <clears throat> they feel called to go to the same part of town where the George Floyd incident happened and minister to the Hispanics there. La, La Lavinia in Burnsville has applied for a religious visa for them to move here, so we are praying <clears throat> with them for favor and continued direction. We'll talk about more of this and their progress in the coming weeks and months. Our next food outreach is not this coming Wednesday, but Wednesday the 22nd, and any volunteers would be appreciated. We meet 5 o'clock at your house, 5 o'clock at Alex and Donna's, and we're going to distribute 50 food boxes to our two adopt a neighborhoods. We're also looking for volunteer teachers for our upcoming nursery toddler classes for the children's ministry to start sometime this spring. Text Donna or sign up in the hospitality tent. I <clears throat> wanted to talk about the way our offerings <clears throat> get uh, spent. We, the ways of offering, we have a box, a black offering box up here on the hospitality table, online at uh, vineyardlongmont.org. Or bank drafts, also. <coughs> but we uh, <coughs> we spend, and you can mail it to. So the things we spend it on are, for instance, this weekend, several of us are going to Denver for a sound workshop, and uh, <coughs> and we also help with temporary housing and meals for the homeless. We help them with haircuts the homeless bags that we make here for our homeless population and many, many other ways. It's very, it's very, the vineyard is a very good cause. Are done? I'm done. Yeah, That's all that's here, except for the spotlight on. Why don't you, why don't you say a prayer for the offering? Just for whoever's here. Father God in heaven, thank you for allowing us to Find places to meet, even if it's on the run. We are continually praying for a permanent home for our congregation, which will happen soon. Uh, please uh, put in people's hearts to give to this cause, Father. We are doing so much in our community, and just put it on people's hearts to, to give to us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, somebody plug me in if you can. Uh, hi everybody. Hi. Hi. Good to be on. I. Uh, it's good to have you here. We have a lot of sick people this week, so I'm glad for those of you who are not sick. Um, I got a slight sniffliness, so if I hug you, I'm not doing you a favor. I'm showing you an act of 
carelessness if I do that. So I've been just trying to do elbows and stuff. Um, how are you guys today? Lovely. Good to have you here. Uh, Sam, it's good to have you here. Everybody, this is Sam Goldstein. Goldstein. Um, uh, Dave and Camille, it's good to have you guys here too. So um, I'm going to talk about Isaiah some more, and I want to focus on this thing called Zion. Uh, is anybody familiar with the term Zion? Just throw out what you what it means to you, what, what Zion... I mean, if you've watched The Matrix, you know that Zion is a city deep beneath the ground where they're hiding, hiding from the robots, right? Uh, what else is Zion? Anybody want to... And, uh, and there was a time when it was nothing but a mound uh, amidst other mounds close to a bigger hill called uh, later called the Mount of Olives. And uh, most people believe that about 2000 B.C., a guy named Abraham <clears throat> was commanded by God to sacrifice his son on a hill that he would show him, a, a little mountain called Moriah. <clears throat> and they think, honey, can you grab me some water? I'm sorry. I'm going to try to get through the best I can. Thank you. Uh, Mount Moriah, uh, which there's a song of in a musical, uh, was the mountain where uh, Abraham was ready to sacrifice his son. And, of course, God intervened and said, don't do it. Uh, don't do it. And uh, that hill was somewhere near Zion. It could have actually been the exact same hill. They don't know. Moriah was right in the same area. Other people think that Moriah was the hill that uh, later on somebody would be sacrificed on, that Jesus would be, would be crucified on. So uh, God is an interesting God. He, he, uh, he speaks and he doesn't do anything by accident. And a lot of times he'll do something that will have a significant second meaning to it later on. And I, uh, when I read the book of Genesis about uh, Abraham being willing to sacrifice his son, which is a bizarre story, uh, but it's on a hill, at least close to ultimately where Jesus would be sacrificed. It's like God was saying, I connect to you, Abraham. I connect to you because you're willing to do something that I'm planning on doing later on. So what's so special about Zion? <clears throat> Eventually, David uh, started a city uh, in modern-day Jerusalem, uh, about 1,000 B.C., about 1,000 years later from the Abraham incident. And uh, on this dusty hill called Zion was a guy that had a, uh, a vineyard and his threshing floor where, where, where he would uh, separate his wheat from his chaff for his wheat fields was right on top of this hill. And eventually... Uh, God led David and his son Solomon to build something on this dusty hill called Zion. Zion, at its root, is nothing more than the name of a hill. Like, you think of a hill around here. Uh, I grew up uh, in Flagstaff, Arizona. Anyone been through Flagstaff? A couple of you guys, some people live there. Uh, Flagstaff, our house is at the foot of a beautiful hill called Mount Eldon. And Mount Eldon was very a rocky bluff. It was a lava bubble. And for, for me as a kid, that Mount Eldon was sort of like like a, a scary place. It's where if you hiked through the woods too far and you ran into the foot of Mount Eldon, then you, you were too far from home. And so as a, as a child, I had sort of this like uh, 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 childhood fear of going too far into the woods. But there's something special about hills throughout the planet. Uh, people that uh, in, in the times, ancient times, the people of God would do false worship on hills. There's something about getting away from everybody and giving yourself to a higher being. And, uh, and God's hill was the preeminent hill. It was the place where eventually he had his temple built. And, uh, and so uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of Jewish pilgrims three times a year would travel from wherever they lived throughout Israel and Judah, and they would travel to this little dusty mount called Zion, where eventually the temple was built, and they would go there to worship. What is your place where you go to worship now? And sometimes we think of heaven being so separate from earth that we almost think we're not supposed to merge the two. The hill called Zion was a merging of heaven and earth. When people came to that hill, they knew they were in God's presence. Why? Because God's temple was there. And inside of God's temple, at least all the way up to the time of Solomon, was this little box which was symbolic of the presence of God, the Ark of the Covenant. And so on the hill, in the building, within the building, deep in the recesses of the building in a place called the Holy of Holies, was, was this ark that represented the presence of God. 
And so for the common Jewish person in those days, they would go to this dusty hill to be with God. But where do you go to be with God? This was where they went. And they had an understanding that Zion uh, was different from other places because Zion was the place where heaven and earth overlapped. Did you know that, uh, that heaven and earth constantly overlap? that uh, God uh, who is hidden uh, desires to be revealed to those of us who are willing to look for him. And God gives us places of overlap. He gives us places like Zion. So if you've been following the book of Isaiah, for example, uh, it's a tragic story because even though they had the temple, they had the hill, they had the Holy of Holies, uh, they were disinterested. Uh, they were caught up in the world around them and and they had betrayed and walked away from the God who had made covenant with them and it's a funny thing when we make commitments in life if we don't follow through on those commitments there are repercussions uh, perhaps the most obvi obvious example I could think of is the marriage commitment when when uh, when we when Don and I got married 36 and a half years ago uh, we made a public commitment that we would be for each other forever. And, uh, and for those of us who have, have had marriage commitments that have been broken, you know that there are consequences to the breaking of those commitments. Uh, there are dire consequences. For those of us with children uh, and have, who've been divorced, we know uh, of the heavy consequences of, of, uh, of breaking a commitment. Breaking a commitment with God is even bigger because it's our eternity. It's our present and it's our future. And so uh, people make commitments to God and it's not something that should be, done, should be done lightly. It's not something we should be afraid of because the God we make a commitment to knows that we're gonna trip and fall. Anybody in this room ever tripped and fell? God knows, it's not like uh, you better not ever make a mistake. Even in marriages, we trip and fall, but we get up again if, if the marriage is to endure. I remember as a young man, I was 18 years old, and, uh, and I uh, made my first public commitment to God. It was sort of like my wedding in a way. Although I think, I think the verbal commitment to God is maybe like uh, getting engaged, and the wedding is like baptism, at least if, you, if we try to make the metaphor complete. I did not even know at that time that I was going to make a public commitment to God. I was just sitting in church and I had began to experience the presence of God. I began to realize that God was real. And for whatever reason, the pastor up there, this was in Maryland, he said, I think there's somebody out there that's ready to, to give their lives to Jesus. Is, is that anybody here? And I, you ever made a commitment you didn't plan on making? Like, what have I just done? I never regretted it. I threw my hand up, he said, come up here. I was in front of, I don't know, 100, 200 people. And, uh, and, and he said, do you want to give your life to Jesus? I, I, and I said, yes, I do. I had never done that before. I would never, ever consider doing that. That was what crazy people did. I had become crazy, officially. And uh, I remember him saying, okay, I'm gonna pray with you. And he took my hand. And I think I probably like, I was gripping his hand so hard because what I was doing, it mattered. It mattered to me. And uh, we got done, he pr finished praying, and, and he made a comment. He says, I think this guy really means what he's saying. Probably because his hand was throbbing, <laughs> you know. And, uh, and I remember walking out of that church thinking, what have I done? But I, I, I meant what I did. I, I meant what I did. And um, sometimes you make a, uh, your heart is ready, you make a commitment, and then you spend the rest of your life figuring out what that means. Uh, certainly, any couple that goes into marriage, uh, they know what they're doing, but they have no idea what they're doing. <laughs> they have no idea. They have no idea. Uh, back in the day when vows were important, when vows meant something, they were needed because uh, every adult knew that these two kids who were committing their lives to each other had no idea what they were getting into. And so when, when the heart grows faint and the will grows weak, Sometimes it's the vow before God that holds us in.
That's not really the case anymore. We have become a, a vow-less society. We have become a society where our, our, ver our words have less and less meaning. And so nobody takes anybody seriously anymore. Nobody takes anybody seriously. I remember I bought a, a, a stackable washer and dryer. And when I plugged it in, it didn't work. And uh, I had let it sit in the garage for several months before I plugged it in. And the, it was past the three-month warranty period. And so I called the lady who I bought it from, and there was a store, and I said uh, the uh, washer and dryer began smoking immediately as soon as we turned it on. And she goes, well, um, and, and you know, it's past the refund time. Uh, can I just replace it? And she goes, well, how do I know that really happened? Uh, how do I know it really started smoking? And I was so mad, because it's like she thinks, she thinks I'm doing what people do these days. They will, we, we will lie to save some money, won't we? I do door dashing part time, as you all know by now. And I was at uh, Dickie's Barbecue yesterday, picking up an order. And uh, the lady who works there was so mad, she was swearing mad because uh, this, uh, she said these, I won't use the words she used, but these couple, this couple that was here was, they're jerks. And when they were done eating, they grabbed the bag, the door dash bag and left. And so I waited while, while uh, she made a new order. And I honestly just sort of chuckled. I thought, what is with people these days? What have we become? What have we become? We are a society without vows. We are a people whose words cannot be taken seriously. Uh, we are a people who will cut corners and steal uh, because we want to. What have we become? Well, the beautiful thing is that there is a God in the universe who is completely aware and he's completely in control. And it seems like, well, how are you in control when people are stealing DoorDash bags at Dickie's Barbecue? How, how does that show God is, is in control? And God is interesting because he is in complete control while uh, uh, creating a space for us to make decisions. And the things will end up in a certain way. No matter how many barbecue bags are stolen, how many of us break our vows? How many of us words can't be taken seriously? God will have his way and it will be beautiful. It will, it will be beautiful. And if, if, you, if you go with God, if, you, if your vows of commitment to Jesus uh, fulfill on some level, everything will be okay. Now I want you to stop for a minute and just close your eyes. I will too. Um, so that you don't think I'm staring at you. I want you to think about the biggest struggle that you're dealing with right now. You know, maybe there's a top three. The three greatest frustrations in your life right now. Think about whichever ones come to mind. Think about the biggest one. Think about that frustration. If you're like me, sometimes you don't want to think about that frustration. You want to just distract yourself. It's one way of dealing with it. Okay, as you think about that frustration, if you have one, I want you to envision, by faith, the God of the universe in Jesus Christ right behind, in between you and your frustration. Like your frustration's an object in front of you, and behind it is the God of the universe. And I want you to look at his face. And I want to tell you something that I've learned about God, that most of the time, he is smiling. And I'll tell you that whatever your frustration is, it's not enough to put a frown on his face. He's smiling. Okay, open your eyes. If you believe that, if you think it's possibly true, that God is in a good mood, that God is okay, that God's not freaking out, it's because of this. It's because he's got the whole thing figured out. He's got a resolution, a, a timetable for a resolution, and it will resolve. And that thing that is too much for you and too much for me, it's going to be okay too. If you hear nothing else this morning, I want you to hear this. That thing, that frustration that you had, it's going to be okay. Why? Because we're going to live forever. And Zion is going to land on the planet someday. That's what the book of Revelation says. It actually says the new Jerusalem. So let's zoom it back in. Isaiah is a book about people that had lost their connection with their covenant vows to God. 
And God, who is smiling and is completely in control, said, well, we're going to have to do something about this. And in this case, the gift of God to his people was exile. Now, they, for, ex, for them, exile meant two nations, the Assyrians conquering the ten northern tribes, the Babylonians conquering the two southern tribes. It meant being carted off to a different country and living, living as slaves to foreigners. How could that be good? How could that be good? How can the frustrations that we're experiencing today be good? How can there be a loving God who's in control when we're going through what we're going through? When our bodies are breaking down? You young guys have no idea what I'm talking about. Older folks know exactly what I'm talking about. Our bodies are breaking down. How could God be in control? God gives this gift called exile. And I think the purpose of exile, at least for, for the ancient Jews, the purpose of their exile was to remind them of their own longing for connection to God. Their own longing to return to this dusty hill called Zion. Because they could remember far away, in their case, the, the rivers of Babylon, the Tigris or the Euphrates, singing their songs. They could remember that there was a time that they could march up the hill singing songs to God and they could be with God. This was not just a theoretical experience. These people, when they went to Zion, they felt the presence of God. Why? Because the presence of God can be felt. It's, it's when, we, when we harden our hearts and we become oblivious to, to this thing called the presence of God. And so God, God has a gift called exile. He didn't just do it once back then. God gives us exile today. When we wander off, when we stray from whatever vows we've made, whatever things we've desired to do for God, he has this gift called exile. And what it is, it's like, I'm going to put you far away from you for a while. I'm going to put you far away from your blessings for a while. I can't help but think that COVID and the latest uh, version of COVID, which uh, at least two families in our church have right now, is God's way of saying, I'm going to push you away to make to, so you can be stirred back into your hunger and your love for me. The thing that you've forgotten. You've forgotten me. You've forgotten how good I am to you. You've forgotten that I'm completely in control. And I'm, I'm, and I'm going to push you away for a bit as kind of a, as an exile, as a wake up. And, and, and what am I going to do when you come to your senses? Am I going to stay distant? No, I am, my arms are wide open. And the book of Isaiah is a book about, I've pushed you away, and now I'm reminding you of how good I am. And I, the reason I love Isaiah, and I think most of you know I'm, I'm hooked on Isaiah, is because it's this interesting combination of, uh, you're far away, but here is the beauty of what I'm giving you. Here's the beauty of what I have for you. And we see a lot of beauty in the pages of Isaiah. In this section, we're in chapters 40 through 51, we see three uh, sections called servant songs. And what these are is, uh, is Isaiah randomly hearing from God and writing it down, these songs of a servant. And it's quite likely Isaiah had no idea who he was writing about. It may, maybe he did know. But he has four servant songs. And each of the songs are songs of the servant of Jesus. They're songs written about Jesus Christ 700 years before Jesus Christ was born. If you want to read something interesting, read the four servant songs. Uh, I'm going to overview them. The first one is in chapter 42, and it's about this gentle servant who comes, and he brings justice to the world. And this gentle servant doesn't shout on the streets. He doesn't bruise reeds. And uh, when I think of this, I picture someone storming through a swamp where there's reeds growing, and just he doesn't knock them over and bruise them. If you watch the videos this week, Dan had an interesting insight about the reeds. These reeds would eventually grow up and become something we use for walking sticks. And a bruised reed uh, would, would, would uh, fail as a walking stick, and pieces of it could shatter and cut your hand or cut your side. The first servant song is about the Messiah who doesn't shout, who doesn't bruise reeds. If there's a candle that's starting to go out, he doesn't snuff it out. He doesn't say, you're nothing but a reed. I'm going to knock you out of the way. You're nothing but a smoldering wick. I'm going to snuff you out. It, it's, I love you. 
and the bruised reed will, will not break, it will not bruise. And, and, and if you think of yourself as a little wick of a candle, we don't do candles anymore, but the idea was is if the thing's going out, you have to relight it. You ever feel like you're going out? You feel like your, your candle wick is on the verge of snuffing out. Well, the, the servant song talks of a guy who will not snuff it out. Why? Because he cares about you. He will reignite your flame. He will not bruise your reed. And this is the first prophetic vision we have in this section of Jesus. The second one is in chapter 49. It's a little bit different. It's about a warrior. And so we go from gentle servant, which I think really just describes Jesus. For the most part, Jesus did not shout in the streets. He got angry a few times. It was at the religious folks. The second one is about a warrior. It's about an arrow polished in the hand of God. It's about a warrior who brings back a remnant people. I'm actually going to read this one. It's chapter 49. And just listen with me as I read. And we might have it on the screen. Look at that. This is the second servant song, the warrior song. Listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, remember who he's talking about, who's talking here. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my mother's womb, he has made, spoken my name. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. Now this is so interesting to me because there's other representations of Jesus at the end of the Bible that talk about a sharpened sword coming right out of his mouth. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow, <clears throat> concealed me in his quiver. You realize up to the time of the birth of Jesus, uh, this image says that God uh, hit, had a polished arrow in his hand, named his son, and he hid him in his quiver, waiting for the moment to pull that arrow out of the quiver and to shoot it into the world. This is an image of the uh, immaculate conception of the birth and ministry of Jesus. He said to me, you're my servant, Israel, in whom I display my splendor. But I have said, I've labored in vain. I've spent my strength for nothing at all. You ever feel that way? My work is a waste of time. I've labored in vain. I'm spending my strength for what? And the Lord smiles, saying, oh no, this thing is coming together. That I have a purpose for you. I have a purpose for the strength you're displaying, just like I did for Jesus. Yet what is due me is in the Lord's hand, and my reward is with my God. And now the Lord says, He who formed me in the womb to be a servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and to gather Israel to himself. I'm honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has been my strength. He says, Is it too small a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept? I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that my salvation may reach the ends of the earth. So it's an interesting verse. And with all prophecies, there's an immediate short-term fulfillment, uh, like we've talked about in Isaiah. God was speaking to the remnant stuck in Babylon that he was going to bring them back. And then there's this long-term fulfillment of a suffering servant who brings the remnant, the people in exile, he brings them back. You and I in this room are people who have been in exile who God is in the process of bringing back. Where does he bring us to? Skip down to verse 16, or 14, and I don't think I have it here. I'll just read it. But Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. So I want to finish by just talking about Zion a little more. I mentioned earlier, it's the place where heaven and earth meet. It's the place where the ancient Jews were brought back to, and they were, in the late 400s, 150 years uh, after the fall of the northern tribe, uh, this group of uh, thousands of people wandered from Babylon back to the dusty hill. The hill did not look the way it had when they left. Most of them had never seen it, just some of the old folks had seen it. And all it was now was the same hill with a pile of rubble on top of it. This was God's promise to these guys. And the rest of Isaiah goes from, I'm going to rebuild the ancient ruin. I'm going to take what's destroyed, and I'm going to rebuild it again. This is our lives. Every piece of rubble that 
represents your life and my life from whatever damage, from whatever thing others have done, whatever exile that the Lord has allowed. Every piece of rubble is, is being rebuilt on this holy hill called Zion. Zion's a metaphor, as I'm sure you've picked up by now. It's a metaphor for the place of God. It's a metaphor for the place to come be with God. It's a metaphor for the place that we are torn away from. Zion still exists. Anybody ever read any of these utopian novels? This idea of, of, of a perfect future? Uh, uh, dystopian uh, novels are popular these days. The Hunger Games is a dystopian uh, fi uh, futuristic novel. Listen to me. Utopia is real. Utopia is a, uh, is a unreal place that we wish could be. Uh, occasionally people try to create a utopia here on earth and it often fails. Utopia is real. It's called Zion. It's an extension of that dusty hill throughout the world. It's funny, when Jesus came, he came to bring the kingdom of God and the kingdom of God is Zion. It's where God exists. And the kingdom of God was within him and it became within us. If you're wondering where utopia is, it's the kingdom of God in the world. It's the kingdom of God inside of you. And then soon after Jesus, his followers made this analogy that the temple of God, which Jesus said would be destroyed, which was a head scratcher for them, the sense was this, don't worry about the temple being destroyed again. Don't worry about that dusty hill losing another building because you guys are my temple. You're my temple. The Holy Spirit, the living God, moving inside of you, the deepest part of yourself, the Holy of Holies, the place where that ark resides. This is the New Testament metaphor. And if we, if you and I are temples of God, and I know I'm speaking lofty here, but these, these things are actually true. God inside of you is the temple, is the presence of God. And if you're the temple of God, like the New Testament says you are, in the context of don't defile yourself, it's, there's the positive aspect is where you go is where the temple goes. The temple of God now has two legs on it that can move around wherever they want to move. You are the temple of God. What does that mean about the place you put your feet? Where did the temple of God reside? On Zion. Where, the place I am putting my feet right now, what is it? It's Zion. Look at your feet. Put your feet on purpose on the ground. If, the, if you are the temple of God, if God is living inside of you, then that place that you just put your foot on is Zion, the place where heaven and earth meet. Anywhere you go, anywhere I go, is Zion, if we're willing to look at it that way. Now, this is all lofty, heady stuff, but I'm telling you, it's all true. Because God, who is smiling, who is not worried about the present or the future, uh, Omicron is not bigger than God, by the way, Sometimes I have to remind myself that. Yeah, a lot of us have to remind ourselves of that as we're trying to figure out how to make a living, for example. Uh, Omicron is not bigger than... Omicron is actually quite small in the scheme of things. Uh, Omicron is small. COVID is small. I'm a history guy, and I was, like to read about World War II. Uh, COVID is small. Read about World War I, and uh, offhandedly reading about somebody who lost their, their brother in the Spanish flu. You know, 1919. The war was bad enough, then came the Spanish flu. Uh, do you know how many people died in the Spanish flu epidemic? Uh, this is crazy. Between 5 million and 50 million. They have no idea. They just were burying people all over the place. My mom's aunt died of the Spanish flu. Um, so, COVID is really small in the scheme of things. Uh, it's big, but it's small. So this is a fairly light exile that God's putting the world through. Let's just hope that people can remember and can wake up. And um, when I think, when I talk about Zion, like some kind of utopian fool, uh, what I think of is the purpose of uh, new church plants like ours. Um, we are an outpost, a Zion outpost. We are people who have God living inside of them, gathering together. Imagine if individually we have God inside of us. What happens when we get together? God magnifying. 
This, the vineyard Longmont, along with all the other churches in town, as is, is they're doing their part, is a Zion outpost. And so we gather to worship on Sundays and other times during the week because uh, we believe in utopia. We believe in the kingdom of God. We believe that God will make everything right at, at, at the appointed time. And you and I, at, at, in some future date, will be uh, in the new heaven and the new earth. Revelation is an interesting book. It describes Jerusalem, the new one, coming down from the sky and landing on the earth. And what does the earth become as soon as that city hits the earth? The earth becomes Zion, just like verse 1. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. Each side of the river there stood a tree, the tree of life, twelve crops of fruit, yielding fruit in every month. The leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. There will no longer be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and His servants will serve Him. They will see His face. His name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or a light bulb. I threw that in. Or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light. They will reign forever and ever. This is our Zion future. And so in the meantime, as we struggle through life, trying to remember our covenant, trying to remember our declarations, God is there smiling, saying, hang in there, folks, hang in there. And he's also saying, I have the kingdom of God here for you now. And part of the purpose of churches, of church, of us, is to experience, to express, to give away the kingdom of God to each other now, to create our own, if you will, utopian society where we're imitating the future kingdom described in the book of Revelation. That the place where we meet, that the city we live in, is in fact a foretaste of the river flowing through the middle of town. The next time you drive over the bridge on the St. Vrain, think about the river of God. And think about trees giving fruit every month. Every river on the planet is a foretaste of the future kingdom. The earth was created to be an icon or a token of the, of the renewed earth. Everything that's old right now will be renewed, including the earth. And I don't know what that'll be like. I don't know if Zion will be the whole planet because it's becoming the whole planet. The kingdom of God spreads. And... Um, it even talks about the light of Zion, the light of, of the servant going to the, to the nations, to the islands. It's gone all the way to Longmont, Colorado. These things are real. It's just that we don't believe it so much of the time because of what we're dealing with. And the encouragement from Scripture is these light and momentary afflictions, they're just preparing us. They're preparing us for the future, an eternal future. And as, even as I say these words that I half the time don't believe, I, I challenge you to receive them as loving words from the God that you've covenanted with. These words that say everything will be okay. For closing, for real this time, I want to finish by quoting Isaiah 41. And um, all this is, is it's a, uh, it's a follow of the, com the words of comfort from God that open the passage, Isaiah 40, comfort, warfare has ended, my people, comfort, comfort to you. And this, I've loved this passage because it's sort of like a raw version of what I just read out of the book of Revelation about the city and the trees. It's a raw version of that, and I think it's more apt to us here today. Isaiah 41, verse 17, the poor and the needy search for water, but there's none. Think about Longmont. <laughs> Think about people that steal food from barbecue places. They're searching for, they're poor and needy, they're searching for water, but there's none. Their tongues are parched with thirst. But I, the Lord, will answer them. Implication, they're crying out to him. God, if you're real, where are you? Are you real? I, the Lord, will answer them. I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. And here it comes. I will make rivers flow 
on barren heights. Did you know rivers don't usually flow up on the heights? They flow down in valleys. But God makes the rivers flow on heights, on hills like Zion. And springs within the valleys. I will turn the desert into pools of water. Okay, now I'm going to describe your life. I will turn the desert into pools of water and the parched ground into springs. Here comes the reforestation. This is your life. I will put in the desert the cedar, the acacia, the myrtle, and the olive. It's not done. I will set junipers in the wasteland, the fir and the cypress together. I don't know how many trees that is. I think it's six or seven. This is the forest of Zion. And when I read about these trees that God's bringing to those who are parched and thirsty, I think about uh, a life gone from devastated to beautiful. And even if you get COVID and die tomorrow, if you're hanging on to Jesus, your life goes from desolate to beautiful. But I think he, his intention is to do it here. I know it is. So the people may see and know and they may consider and understand that the hand of the Lord has done this, that the Holy One of Israel has created it. Can you guys stand up? Lord, I thank you that these things that I'm ranting about are actually true and that there is a place. There is a place you're preparing for us and there is a place that you're reforesting down here, Lord, down here where we struggle with hunger and thirst. And we ask you to bring your kingdom, Lord. Bring your kingdom.